Hello, and welcome to the Coralosophy Podcast. This is a bite-sized back-to-school tip episode. I've never done one of these before, but I have this form on the main page at Coralosophy.com. It, it's an embedded Google form. It, it, so if you go to Coralosophy.com, it's right there on the front where listeners to the show can write in about a variety of things in a format that I will actually be able to keep track of. Right. So uh, if you, you send me a Facebook message, it gets buried with a whole bunch of other Facebook messages. If you send me an email, same problem. So this form I put on there a few months back has been collecting a lot of different types of thoughts and comments from listeners, including listeners who would like to come on and share some thoughts with you. So as school ramps back up, I'm going to air some of these, and there'll be short episodes where listeners to the show had had been listening and coming up with their own things that they'd like to add. Before we get to today's bite-sized back-to-school helper, uh, we are going to just remind you that as school ramps back up, especially if you are in an area that has the, the masks coming back, that the best singer's mask on the market is the resonant singer's mask from mymusicfolders.com. It's flexible, it's safe, it's fittable, washable. You can, for people who are immunocompromised and need that added N95-ish type filtration, you can add in filters. It's just a sweet high-tech mask. And you can enter Coralosophy at checkout to get a 5% discount, which if you're ordering for a large group, that really adds up. And of course, you're gonna want your Sight Reading Factory memberships filled back in for all of your students, yourself so that you can get those assessments going, you can get that daily practice going, and you can make literacy, a dr- the, the dream of literacy, a reality. And Sight Reading Factory, I believe, is also the best tool. I don't talk to you guys about the things that, uh, the crappy stuff. I really talk to you about the things that make my job easier, and I believe they can make your job easier as well. So get those memberships and enter Coralosophy at checkout. Last but not least, you're going to need sheet music. And that means you're going to need to go to Graphite Publishing, where they have composers like Eric Barnum, Tim Takash, Jocelyn Hagen, Christopher Harris uh, is got some new stuff on there. Um, I believe you're going to see some Reginald Wright stuff on there soon. Oh, I probably better edit that out. And a variety of other uh, awesome composers. It's just that that catalog has exploded in the last year. So go over to Graphite if you haven't been there recently. And of course, you can enter Coralosophy at checkout. And then you're going to definitely hit up RyanMain.com for his independently published stuff that's just so much fun for kids to sing. They dive into it full throttle and they come out with these great products of of pieces that they just really really love to sing we sang two of ryan's pieces last year in virtual weird hybrid back and forth school and it really uh, added to the meaningfulness of that experience so head over to ryanmain.com and enter coralosophy at checkout there as well you guys get all the hookups when you listen to this show so good luck with your back to school preparation so today's bite-sized choir tip comes from the mind and the suggestion of William Bennett. William is the director of choirs at Cane Bay High School, and he and I both share a passion, which I thought would be a great short conversation about the use of Carol Dweck's mindset research and scholarship in our classrooms with the choral rehearsal and how that psychological insight by Dr. Dweck plays into a more productive choral culture and choral environment. So stick around and enjoy this conversation. So Billy B, (laughs) as as all of your friends call you, I'm sure. It's funny you say that because we did a a Zoom call with Eric Whitaker earlier this year and he kept calling me Bill. So all my students call me Bill. (laughs) (laughs) Now tell me a little bit about you and your your gig. What what, What kind of choir director are you anyway? So uh, primarily, I'm a high school choir director um, here in the Charleston area. We live in Somerville. It's about 20 miles outside of Charleston, South Carolina. Uh And um, I have about 160 kids across five different choirs uh, at the high school. We are about a 2,000 student high school. And um, but I also am the music director at Somerville Presbyterian Church here in town. Um, So it keeps me pretty busy. So um, did, I, I came across, of course, you and I are going to be chatting here about um, some growth mindset ideas in uh, the choral rehearsal room and Carol Dweck's work as it relates to that. Uh, I'm a big fan of her work as well. Um, I came across her book as part of a professional development uh, assignment at my school. And, uh, and, and of course, I, I approached it with my eyes being rolled, as you always do. <laughs> 
when of you're course. getting, yeah, like the next thing you have to do in your summer PD before school starts or, or whatever. Um, but I remember just having a, a very different reaction by the time I'd started reading that book or her book um, of like, oh my goodness, this is, this is choir. This, this is, she's yeah, just, absolutely. She's just describing choir when she talks about uh, how students will approach um, things as if they have talent for a thing or they don't. Like it's right. just, it's, it's right. a, it's a measurement of their inherent talent. And, and, and I started to realize, well, that's how kids approach music. They, they think they were just born that way or, you know, whatever. So um, I, that, so I'm excited about that. So what, how about you? How did you get into her stuff for the first time? So um, probably one of the most influential books I ever read um, just kind of picked it up. I, I'm a, I'm a former athlete. I know that you uh, have athletics in your past as well. And so I love coaching books and, I've read, um, you know, Coach K and Calipari and uh, Patino and all those guys, Bobby Knight. But um, I, I picked up a book called Bounce uh, by Matthew Side, who's an English uh, writer. Um, and he was a former Olympic uh, table tennis champion. And he talked about um, that's where he got into kind of deliberate practice and that kind of idea that Eric, uh, Eric Anderson stuff. But um, in that book, he talked about mindset. And um, then I and he also talked about a book called Talent is Overrated by uh, Jeffrey Colvin. So I went and read that. And that was where, um, you know, Matthew Side says we have to unpack the talent myth, um, the idea of talent being this fixed thing that, that you're born with. Um, and, and it really totally changed the way I, I taught. It totally looked, changed the way I looked at um, my students. And so Matthew Side uh, quotes this book. Uh, Jeffrey Colvin quotes this book. So I said, well, let me go to the source. And I picked up uh, Mindset. And it was fascinating. Like, I, as you said, it, it is choir. I mean, it's teaching, it's coaching, it's all of the above. But this idea that um, we either are uh, uh, fixed in the traits that we have and the skills that we have, or it's something that we can grow and expand upon. Um, that idea kind of fascinated me. Right, right. It, the one metaphor that I use to explain this to people is uh, basketball. Since you're, you're uh, you've got that, you brought up sports and coaching. I, I like the basketball metaphor because you could take a basketball star like LeBron James and you could say, um, you know, that I, no matter what I do, like, so that's the idea of talent versus work. Uh, mm -hmm. there, there is nothing I could do to be LeBron James. Uh, there is no amount of work that I could do to be 6'10 and be able to dunk and all of those things. Right. However, it that and so this is where I point this out to students. It depends on what your goal is. So are you playing basketball so that you can be as good as LeBron James? Or are you playing basketball because you love playing basketball and you want to get as good at it as you possibly can? And in which case, the, then the, the equation is completely different, which is I can get a lot better than I am now at basketball if I were to exercise every day, to do drills every day, to practice at, you know after school every day. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to be LeBron James, but that shouldn't be the goal anyway. It's, it's your own personal growth, hence the growth mindset. Right. And that's where you look at someone like Steph Curry who, when he was coming out, um, everyone said he was too small and he, you know, not fast enough, but he, he, so he went and learned how to shoot. He said, I'm just going to shoot better than everybody else. Mm -hmm. And so, and he totally changed the league in that way. So, mm -hmm. but I agree, you know, I, I, um, once I started approaching this, you know, looking at my students, cause I used to say, you know, when I was picking my top group, I'd say, Oh, I want really talented kids. I want the kids who are the most talented. And when I stopped looking at them in terms of talent and instead of looking at them in terms of work ethic and growth potential and, you know, what are what are they, um, you know, how are they approaching their own skill building? Mm -hmm. um, and I started talking to them in, in terms of, um, you know, I'd say, OK, well, my seniors, should they have more skill because they have more experience and they've worked longer at it. So when I'm talking to my freshmen, I can say, hey, I don't want you to look at these seniors and say, oh, I can't do that. Right. I want to say, hey, if I work really hard. I'll be able to do that when I'm in their shoes in a couple of years. And it's a totally different approach to what we do. Right. Uh, what would you say are some of the, the ways that you approach this in the classroom as far as a, as a routine? Do you, is it something you talk to the kids about directly or do you kind of trick them into having a growth mindset? Uh, yes. All of the all, above. All of those okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so one of the things I tell them, I share with them a story. Um, you know, I uh, came late to singing. I was uh, a band kid. I, I uh, played French horn uh, growing up. And so in my, in my middle school experience, we had to choose band or chorus. You couldn't do both. Mm -hmm. And so I was a band kid and um, I was a sophomore in high school before I started singing. 
And I, I was the kid who said, I can't sing. You mm-hmm. know, they would say, they would say, Hey, you know, you should come sing in choir. And I said, no, no, I can't sing. I can't sing. And so my, my girlfriend at the time, um, thank God for her. She, uh, used to stand next to me in, in church and she'd hear me singing the hymns and she'd say, Hey, you, you know, you're really pretty good at this. You should audition for the musical. And so I went and auditioned for the musical it was sound of music. And I got a final callback for uh, the lead role. And I thought, wow, okay, well, maybe, maybe there's something to this. Um, I didn't get the role, but it was enough for me to, to explore and to say, maybe I can do this. Um, and fast forward a couple of years and I ended up auditioning um, at the college of Charleston and Furman on French horn and vocal performance. And they offered me a music scholarship to sing. And I thought, wow, okay, maybe I, maybe I really can do this. Um, but I'll never forget my first voice lesson. I'm sitting there with my, uh, and in and, and, and all honesty, they gave me a scholarship because I could sing a low C. Right. <laughs> they said, I, I can hear that. Yeah, they said, <laughs> we need you in the bass section. But <laughs> um, no, so my first voice lesson, my, my voice teacher sat me down and she said, um, do you know why you're here on scholarship? And I said, well, you know, I, I think maybe I'm, a, I'm pretty good at this. She said, well, you're here on potential. I said, okay. She says, do you know what that means? And I said, well, sure. And before I could answer the question, she says, it means you're not very good right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, but then she said, but if you work really hard and do the things we ask you to, you, you have a really high potential of where you could end up. Uh-huh. And for me, that was kind of my first lesson of, of growth potential and saying, okay, this is going to take a lot of work. It's going to take a lot of time and effort, and it's not going to be easy. But if I do the things they ask me to do, then I could be really good down the road. Um, so I share that with my students and I tell them, I say, look, you have a lot of potential. <laughs> you know, you're not very good right now, or you might have a lot of skill that you brought with you from your middle school. But my job over the next four years is to see where you can grow mm-hmm. and to help you to move into that next level, to prepare you to audition for college scholarships and to move on or to go and sing with a, a community chorus or continue singing for the rest of your life. Um, and so that's how I, I, I treat it with them. But I, the, the other way I do it in a rehearsal setting, um, I talk to them. I don't know about where you are, but where we are now, you know, our community is just is just exploding um, with with new growth and, and building. And um, so, we, you know, new hotels are going up and new neighborhoods. The, the school where I teach, the, the, the community is just expanding tremendously. And so I was driving around town one day and I saw, you know, I was driving by and going my way to work and and. One day you drive by and there's just a bunch of trees. And the next day you drive by and the trees are gone. And you say, okay, they're going to build something there. And then you drive by for about a month or so. And then you say, okay, they're just pushing dirt around. Doesn't really look like they're doing much. Then a month or so later, there's some walls going up and there's some structure that's there. And and then the electricians come in and they add and add and add and add. And then, you know, six, seven months, a year down the road, there's a hotel there. So I approach it with my students about from an architect, architectural standpoint. And I say, if we're building a concert, then we're building a hotel. And the first part of that, the site reading part of it, the foundational level is pushing dirt around and putting those fundamental things in that's going to be the foundation of that piece of music. And then we put walls up and we put detail and detail. And I said, our goal, our opening night for the hotel is the concert, Right. And so by the time we get to the concert, we want to have all the floors done. Each piece of music is like a different floor, but it kind of puts them in a mindset of saying, okay, this is not Glee. This is not where we're going to pick up the music today and perform it next week. (laughs) This is going to be a long process. It's going to take some time. And the process, what we do throughout the process is going to inform the finished product and it's going to make it better or worse. Um, And then once we're done with it, we sit back and we say, okay, how do we do? Did it end up the way we wanted it to end up? How close to that vision did we get or how far away were we and how much more do we have to continue to learn in order to get closer to that vision the next time around? Mm -hmm. Now, that's a a good explanation of the psychology, I think, from the group standpoint. Have you ever run into battles that you feel like you have to fight on the individual level with kids accepting a growth mindset? In other words, they have... Um, maybe that fixed mindset that she talks about where uh, a fixed mindset person is oftentimes a, a someone who is quite talented. Uh, in other words, they are pretty good coming into the classroom in choir in the beginning of ninth grade. And sometimes they're the hardest to convince 
that we have to do more work because they've kind of, especially in singing, I find that this is a, a thing where uh, if, if kids are really good singers, I'm um, air quotes, good singers when they're, you know, eight or nine years old or whatever, they've been, they've grown up their whole life being told how great, they, oh, their voice is just so beautiful. It's like an angel. You're so talented. You're so gifted. And then they get to the high school choir program and often cases and some a teacher's finally telling them, hey, but this, here's all the things you have to work on. Right. And they can <laughs> shut down. Have you ever seen that? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And those those oftentimes are the hardest ones to teach, um, you know, and you have to that's where building those individual relationships is really important with each student and understanding, you know, what their goals are. What are they trying to get out of choir? Are they just kind of there to, to hang out or do they want to go and be, uh, you know, a college voice major? Um, and that's where I kind of meet them on that end. But but it is really, really difficult when when you do get those kids that they say, well, I'm already good enough. I don't, I don't need to continue working. And sometimes uh, what I see is, is students kind of pass them in growth. And then they start looking around and saying, oh, wow, these other kids, they, they used to be kind of way behind me. If you think about it that way, you know, they weren't as quite as good sight readers. Or they, they couldn't sing quite as well in tune. And now all of a sudden, well, they're the ones getting the solo and I'm not anymore. And so that's kind of the aha moment for a lot of them to say, oh, well, I really need to kind of put the work in. Right. But I, I think it's important to, to note, too, one of the things that Carol talks about it, that we have to be careful of here is that we're not one or the other. You know, we're we're yeah. a mixture of both. Yep. And, and sometimes um, we do kind of get those fixed mindsets. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not a good or bad. Um, you know, so we have to kind of find balance in that. We Obviously, we want that growth mentality, that growth uh, mindset of getting better and improving. But um, a lot of times self-confidence comes from knowing what you're good at. And, and that's kind of the fixed mindset side of it, too. Right. Absolutely. And and sometimes we will exhibit growth or fixed mindset uh, tendencies or traits on different aspects of our life. Um, you know, and like you could have a, a, a kid who's got a great growth mindset when it comes to their math class and they're they're getting that B minus, but they're absolutely willing to keep plugging away and try to get a little bit higher grade next week, you know, that kind of thing. But then they might walk into the choir class and be one of those, you know, talented eight-year-olds that, that you know, <laughs> yep. and, and so it, they, they might, and I think that's one of, one of the activities that I do. And I'd be interested to hear of some of the activities that you do too, or uh, that play into to teaching them this, these lessons is I actually uh, do a reflection activity with my kids at the beginning of the year ish not like right away, but like at the beginning of the year, once we've gotten to know each other a little bit better at, the, at uh, early on, where I ask them to reflect on what areas specifically of their life do they feel like they are a growth mindset or a fixed mindset person so that they can start to jot down, like, I feel like I'm, I've am i got a good growth mindset going here on this aspect, but I'm a fixed mindset over here. And, and what what where do you feel like you could tweak those things? Uh, the first thing I do, of course, I don't make them all read the book. Uh, but I have you seen have you seen the YouTube video that uh, that she narrates that's kind of like cartoon drawings and it's one of those animated videos that she's explaining the concept? No, I have watched her TED talk though. Okay, yeah, so yeah, the TED talk's great, but I found for, like for the high school kids, it's like six or seven minutes long, and so it's yeah. a good length, and it's that one of those ones where the cartoon is being drawn as as the yeah yeah talking. I don't I think that's just called an animated video, but. Um, uh, I'll send, I'll put a link in the show notes when we post this too, so that people can see that for me, what I do is I show that video and that generates a short conversation in what is in the concept of fixed and growth mindset. And then I have them reflect on what types of uh, areas they are. And then throughout the year, what I, that, what I've discovered is that just sets up the vocabulary for when I'm noticing like fixed mindset approaches to a, a growth mindset thing like singing yeah. Um, it, when I start to notice those things, I will, I will just say, Hey, I, that seems like a kind of a fixed mindset that you can't sing that note. Uh, or maybe could you, could you rephrase that in a growth mindset way? And then they, they laugh at me. They make fun of me for this because I talk about it so much, <laughs> but then they'll say, I just haven't learned how to sing that note yet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so um, I've not done that activity, but, I've, but I'm going to steal that for sure. Yeah. Um but well, you just hit on something that, that Carol talks a lot about too that I think is really important is is that power of yet. You know, mm -hmm. she says the power of not yet, and and I do. Um, I've got a, a sign up in the in the choir room that has the word can't, and there's a big X on it. And I tell my students, you no, know, day one freshman choir, I say, I'm going to stretch you. We're going to do all these you know different things. I'm just trying to figure out what they know. 
And I say, I don't want you to use the word can't unless you're absolutely using it appropriately. For instance, I can't sing a high C. I'm physically unable to do that. I say, however, my range, I do know it tops out at about a G on the, you know, on the treble clef. And then I demonstrate for them. I say, so I want you to eliminate that word in your mindset to say, because that, that's where we put the wall up and we say, oh, I can't do it. And oftentimes students will say, oh, I can't do it. And I'll say, yet. <laughs> Right. And so we got to we've got to work on it. And so maybe if you're having trouble with it and I tell them, I say, you can tell me I'm having trouble with it. I need more help with that. Um, you know, it's difficult for me. I'm like, I will accept any of those things, but we're going to grow and learn how to do it together. Um, so one, well, one of the things I do with them, um, especially after performances, we do a lot of, of post performance kind of reflection. And so I have a, um, a we call it five for five for uh, five for Friday. Sometimes we'll do it during the middle of the semester, but um, it's basically, you know, you write down five things that we did well, five things that we need to improve upon, five things that you learned through the process of this, uh, putting this music together, yeah. five things that you think you still need to continue to work on. Right. And, and we go through that and I tell them, you know, I say in some, you know, a lot of times they say, oh, well, th this is dumb. Is this for a grade? You know, they, they just care about their grade. But I say, look, this is the important part. <laughs> this is the part where you're telling me this is what I feel like I'm really comfortable with. And I can look at it and say, I said, look, if everybody in here says I want to continue getting better at sight singing, well, then I'll design more exercises so we can get better at sight singing. You know, it kind of helps me to drive the ship a little bit and help them to improve their skills. So that's the way we use it as far as, um, you know, checking our growth throughout the school year. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I, and I think one of the the big overarching pitch, pictures about this topic for me that I think is really important is uh, is helping kids understand that there there is a a growth area for everyone, and there Absolutely. and 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 that in a choir we are a team, right? And so if yeah. even if I can't be, I don't know if there's a Le, LeBron James of choral singing, but if there was a if there was a LeBron James of choral singing, and maybe I can't be that but I can be a whole lot better for my team. I can be a Steph Curry, or I could be a, uh, some kind of, I could be the sixth man uh, who comes in and uh, in a pinch and helps out the team when they're tired or, or whatever. Um, but I think that's the aspect that I try to drive home is it's about your own personal growth and you can't compare yourself to anyone else or you become fixed mindset really quick, quickly because you Absolutely. can't control other people's uh, journeys. Well, Coach K talks about that a lot too. You know, I, I'm, I do a lot on team building. We do a lot of team building games at the beginning of the year. We have a big retreat and half of the retreat is just, you know, doing um, different style team building games um, where, where it forces them to work together and, and, and it forces them to understand that not everybody can be the leader. That that's really inefficient. And, mm -hmm. you know, you got to let it go a little bit. But um, one of the things Coach K talks about is uh, in the context of a team, it's easy to look at the best player and say, oh, well, um, you know, they're the best player and I'm never going to be that good. But what he talks about is everybody has to understand what do they bring to the team, right? Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I may not be able to sing, uh, you know, a high C like the tenor over there. And I'm really impressed that he can sing the high C, but I can sing a low C and I know I bring that to the table. And so I'm going to do what I can on my end of it. And then we're all going to bring our best to the table and that's going to help us be the best. Um, you know, I, as an athlete, I was not a starter. I was, I was a bench player, you know, and there were a lot of games where I didn't even get in the game. And it was so frustrating for me to, especially when we lost, to feel like there's something I could have done. Maybe I could have helped a little bit to, to help the team win. But over time, I also understood that my contribution in practice was just as important as, as a game, that my job was to give my best in practice so that the starters were ready to play when the game started, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and in a choir, I mean, thank goodness in a choir, we don't have a bench. <laughs> I bring up that analogy to kids a lot. And that we just like, yep. think about what would that be like, if like, everybody's here every day, we practice the songs. But then on the day of the concert, I put out a list on the wall. <laughs> Listen, Chris, I'm this horrified. Who, you, who gets I, to sing? <laughs> I've heard horror stories of teachers of conductors who will go down the line and they'll say, you sing, you sing, you don't sing, you sing, you don't sing. And I'm like, what is that teaching your kids? Uh -huh. What is that telling them? You know, that I, this just horrifies me that anybody would say, you know, you haven't demonstrated to me that you're good enough to do this, you know? Um, yeah. 
And, and, and so that's, I think it's so damaging. And I, and I think ultimately for me, that was what stuck out to me when I read Bounce, when I read Mindset is, you know, Dr. Dweck talks about the, the, the damaging effects of uh, praise when, when it's not warranted, um, the damaging oh, effects yeah. of, um, you know, just how, how what we say to a child can truly transform what they think in the way that, so for instance, in, in the 1990s experiment that she did, you know, they gave a group of students a, a, a math test. They t- and so they said, everybody takes a baseline test. And um, they told one group, uh, they took half of the group and they said, okay, you did really well on this math test. You must be very smart. You must be very talented at this, you know? And the other group, they said, well, you worked really hard at this. You did a great job and worked really hard at it and, 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 and succeeded. And then they, give, they gave this, these two groups uh, a math test that, with impossible answers. There was no way to, to, to answer these questions. And what they found is the students they told, you know, you, you were talented at this, the fixed mindset group showed higher test anxiety and they showed um, a quicker, um, uh, they wanted to give up faster on the test. And the students who were in that kind of growth mindset, because they were told you worked hard at it, they worked longer at the, pro- at the, the problems and, and, and showed less test anxiety. Um, and then they went, and the fascinating thing is they went back again and gave them the same baseline test in the, the fixed mindset students that the teacher had put in that fixed mindset by saying, you're really talented at this, scored worse on the baseline test than they did the first time. And, I, and I'm thinking, this is what's wrong with the education system. <laughs> this is what yeah. we do to our students. Mm-hmm. You know, we tell them you're really good at it. And then they, then you, you clam up because the, 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 the problem is when you're told you're good at something, you, that's where you get into imposter men, the mentality, right? Imposter syndrome, because mm-hmm. you say, oh, I have to duplicate that result or they're gonna think I'm not as smart as they thought I was. Right. And that's where the test anxiety comes in. And so when I started reading this, I, I thought back to my early years of teaching, thinking, oh, my gosh, how many students did I destroy? Exactly. Yeah. And the way I was talking right. to them, thinking I was I was supporting them, thinking mm-hmm. I was praising them. And in reality, what they're hearing is you better do it that way every time or he's going to think that you're not as good as you really are. Right. And so they tell themselves that, too. So if if I'm if, if I'm successful because I'm smart. And then I realized that no one is always successful. So I, as a kid, I process it this way. I'm successful because I'm smart. So what do I think about myself when I fail the test or fail the assignment? Well, that must be because I'm dumb. Right. And, and that logic seeps in early on uh, when they start hearing that. And so, yes, it's all about re- pra- praising. Yes, but praising the effort, praising the process. Absolutely. Um, rather than praising the some kind of an innate uh, ability. Uh, that's extremely important. <clears throat> yeah. So, and the, the hard part there, you know, Carol also talks about being careful not to get into a false growth mindset because it is about praising the process, but it's about the students understanding the process is connected to the outcome. And if you didn't do well on that test, let's go back and look and see how were you studying for it? What did you study? Did you mm-hmm. did you spend enough time looking over this um, and, and, you know, analyzing those results? What was it that led to that result if you didn't like it, as opposed to just saying, oh, well, you know, you're not smart enough, you didn't do well on the test. But I think where a lot of people get in that fault scores mindset is they say, well, the outcome doesn't matter anymore. You know, and that's where I, I remember, uh, I actually played your podcast, your, your little car talk about the does the performance matter? I played that for my kids. Oh, okay, great. You know, after during the pandemic, because we were really struggling with that, you know, um, because we couldn't perform, we were trying to do some, some, some virtual performances and all that. But the kids were, and we, so we sat and talked about that. You know, I played the, the, the podcast for them and we, we, we had a conversation. They said, yeah, it just kind of feels like we're doing all this work for nothing. You know, and I said, yeah, I, I bet if, um, you know, going back to the architectural, you know, analogy, if, if someone was building a building but that no one was ever going to step foot in, I bet they wouldn't bring the same kind of pride to their work as if they were building it for you know, the president or, or, you know, the prime minister or whatever, or <laughs> you even, know what I mean? Or they might even cut safety corners. Like they, Absolutely. they might, they might they would not, say it doesn't matter. Yeah, why, doesn't matter. why, why do it? Right. So it's important that, um, you know, we do tie those outcomes to the process to say, if we want this outcome, this is the process we need to follow. And then let's reevaluate it and see how close do we get? how do we do? where do we do well? What do we need to continue to growing, you know, grow uh, on? Um, you know, so I always tell my choir, I, I, if you want to look at choir in a fixed growth mindset, you know, 
Um, I'm not the choir director that says, you know, we sound great in October. Okay, that's as good as we're going to be. You know, right. I'm the choir director that says we sound great in October. Man, how good are we going to be in March? I can't wait to hear how good we're going to be right after we do do this for an entire school year or, or in May even, you know. So that's kind of how I approach it. Yeah, growth mindset is just uh, encouraging them to always be looking ahead to the next thing. Absolutely. Uh, whether it's as a group, the group goals or their individual goals. And that's really important. Well, uh, on the way out today, uh, that's been, this has been really, uh, really informative. And I think actionable for people who don't know Carol Dweck's work. I think you, you've given us a pretty good summary of some of the key points, but I am going to put uh, a link to her uh, TED Talk the animated video and her book, just because I do strongly encourage, I know you do too, people to check that that out. Uh, but what uh, what are some final thoughts that you might have for people? Or, or here's how I would like it like you to respond to, if it's okay. Um, ways that you would encourage a a choir director. You and I uh, have some years behind us. It looks like no offense, <laughs> um, but uh, for maybe say a younger teacher that is is needing needing some growth mindset advice for themselves, but then also to get their, their school year started uh, off on the right foot in this way. What, what are some early, early year tips for, for us? Yeah, I think um, A, build a network of, of other fine choral conductors and, and musicians and educators that you can go to, you know, when you need advice and, and ideas. I think one of the problems with from a conducting standpoint being in that fixed mindset you feel like you have to do it all yourself and you have to know all the answers and and we don't you and i have taught long enough to know that we don't know all the answers mm -hmm. and we have to continue learning and growing so find somebody in your district or your area or um, just reach out and acda obviously is a great great resource for networking with great conductors but um, get involved with those people and, and pick their brains and get ideas from them but um, but i think at the beginning of the school year you know i spend um, so much time at the beginning of the year, just kind of uh, what I call it leveling up. You know, I, I start things kind of easy. And then I, as soon as I feel like they got it, I change something up. If we're doing solfege exercise, we'll take it, we'll take a syllable out or we'll, we'll, we'll switch it around. Um, we'll sing sight reading examples in retrograde, you know, mm -hmm. just to, just to make it more difficult for them and keep them on their toes and keep them thinking um, and being really creative about that and, and setting that as the expectation for the year for right. my students to understand, Hey, as soon as, as soon as we've mastered this, we're going to level up to the next thing. And we're going to continue raising that bar and pushing ourselves to get better um, to, to see how good can we really be. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate the advice for everybody. And uh, definitely second to your Thank you, as always, for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed this short conversation about Carol Dweck's mindset research. And I, I think it's, re if you're not familiar, please buy the book, watch the TED Talk, watch the YouTube video, which will be in the show notes. It's really mind-bending stuff. Uh, I think you will really enjoy it if you dig into it just a little bit. As always, like, share, leave comments, um, leave ratings and podcast apps. The Coralosophy Patreon is a great way for you to get involved behind the scenes in the underwriting of the cost of the show if you think that this show provides you value or just because you want to be helpful and you want to contribute to this resource uh, for others so that it can be maintain free, uh, free downloads, no paywalls, all those types of things. So head over to patreon.com forward slash Coralosophy uh, if you would like to be a part of that for $3 a month. The other ways you can help, of course, are to head to the sponsors, Voce Vista, Sight Reading Factory, Graphite Publishing, RyanMain.com, My Music Folders, and using that Coralosophy discount code when you purchase things from those awesome coral vendors. Thanks a lot, everybody. See you next time.